Does it sound all right? Are you happy? Sounds a bit to me. Sounds a bit sibilant. Is it all right? You're nodding. You think it's sibilant as well. So I better be a bit careful with my. Anyway, I think the geese is gone now. So when techies go, we all die. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. So first off, uh, thank you very much, Moore Agmany. Thanks to Homerton College and the Philippa Pierce Memorial Steering Group for, in for inviting me to give this lecture. And thanks to, to all of you who've taken the effort to come today. I knew Philippa a little and always had the sense about her that she was part of the reason why I and all of us writing for children have the good fortune and pleasure of having an audience. She created scenes of such powerful feelings, anxiety, loss, mystery, danger, fun and the like, full of meaning and significance, that she created readers and readers create other readers. Do we have a whistle? Yes. Do we have a hum? I tell you what, I wonder whether the guy can just switch off the sound altogether. That might be easier. I'm yeah? Video oh, right. Dear, oh, dear. So if we put that down there, mm, we have a problem, don't we? <laughs> you can pick that up, can't you? No, no, not you. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is stop all that. Can he, cut the, can he cut the speakers? Because otherwise you're going to go mad. <laughs> the slow madness of sound going round. I think it's called shash in the business. You are getting shash, not me. <laughs> I mean, far be it for me to object to you having shash rather than me. <laughs> shash is nice, you know. Sounds like my mother, you know. Shash, it's nice, have it, it's good. <laughs> People are doing eating shash. It's right to it. They're wearing them like that. <laughs> They're not mum. Oh, they are. <laughs> so, did they like the shash? No, they didn't mum. Nobody noticed the shash. <laughs> anyway. She's not here. No, she's not here. No, she died 30 years ago. No. <laughs> she's always here. She's always here. Um, it's horrible, isn't it? We can't go on, can we? Not with that. Not with the whistling. We can't do whistling. Hmm? You're right, you're happy now, are you? Yes. So I'll move that out of the way, okay. Well, my job today is to talk about poetry, and I should clear up something right at the outset. The word apology does, of course, mean some kind of statement to do with being sorry, but there's an older meaning to the word, which signifies a defence of a position, coming from the Greek word we know today as apologia. So I won't be saying sorry for anything today. I will be putting up an argument in defence of poetry. And you might well ask, but who is attacking it? And this takes us back to Philip Sidney, who wrote a paper which was named, not by him, but by his first publishers, one as an apology for poetry, and the other as the defence of poesy. And it was probably written in the winter of 1579 to 80. Philip Sidney grew up at the heart of the ruling elite's political and religious struggles. He was given a full formal education from the age of seven, first with tutors from whom he learned Latin, Italian and French, and then at the age of ten he was sent away to Shrewsbury Grammar School, a move that allied the family with the English Protestant hierarchy, but also entailed a nine and a half hour day working through Cicero, Terence, Cato, Tully, Caesar, Livy, Ovid, Horace, Virgil, Xenophon, as well as the French romances Belfort admits a good deal of worship along Calvinist lines. Next stop was Christchurch, Oxford, with yet more Cicero, Horace and Virgil, along now with Aristotle's works on rhetoric, or what we would now call literary theory. It was at this point that he caught the eye of the Tudor's top man, Sir William Cecil. To spell this out, this meant Philip Sidney was going to be groomed for high office in Protestant England. One of the consequences of this was that he was sent by Elizabeth on a kind of three-year prototype grand tour of Europe, taking in Poland, Prague, Hungary and Italy, as well as places near at home, intermingled with diplomacy and scouting for possible suitors for Elizabeth, or playing the game of scouting for suitors. This amazing period also saw him, also drew him into the circle of the Tudor's spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham, and many of Europe's major power players. When he gets back to England, he's clearly one of Elizabeth's boys, with his life, career and marriage circumscribed by the nuanced requirements of the Elizabethan experiment with nationalist, unreformed Protestantism. 
So what is someone of this background doing writing a defence of poetry? Well, the year he wrote it, Edmund Spencer had dedicated his poem, Shepherd's Calendar, to Sydney. But there was another event. You remember that the Elizabethan experiment didn't simply involve a struggle between Catholic and Protestant, but also involved what would turn out to be a deeper and more long-lasting struggle, signs of it are all about us today, of unreformed Protestantism's conflict with the various strands of Calvinism, which we've come to call Puritanism. 1579, when Stephen Gosson dedicated a pamphlet to Sydney called The School of Abuse, containing a pleasant invective against poets, pipers, players, jesters, and such like caterpillars of a commonwealth, <laughs> setting up the flag of defiance to their mischievous exercise and overthrowing their bulwarks by profane writers, natural reason, and common experience. A discourse as pleasant for gentlemen that favour learning, as profitable for all that will follow virtue. This title in itself lays out very well the Puritan position. It's militant with its flag of defiance. It is, in spite of the Puritan's seeming hostility to unfettered imagination and sensual imagery, happy to introduce a visceral poetic image, caterpillars of a commonwealth. And it lumps together a set of, set of people whose activities in the name of verbal and bodily pleasure, he deems to be mischievous. Poets, pipers, players, jesters and such like. Or well, surprisingly, perhaps, he claims these people could be overthrown not by religious argument, but by common experience, natural reason, and the words of profane, and in this case this just simply means non-religious, writers. The result will be profitable for all that will follow virtue. Virtue is a key word here. Puritans are virtuous people who, if they work, study, and are industrious, will achieve virtue, a godly state of being here on earth. Poets, pipers, players, and jesters, we don't have virtue. They're, we're mischievous. Here is Gosson in full flow, and I should say here the part of this talk today is about us enjoying the vigour, self-confidence, and inventiveness of 16th century poetic prose as a form of poetry in itself. Here he is in full flow. The deceitful physician giveth sweet syrups to make his poison go down the smoother. The juggler casteth a mist to work the closer. The siren's song is the sailor's rack, the fowler's whistle, the bird's death. The wholesome bait, the fish's bane, the harpies have virgin's faces and vultures talons. Hyena speaks like a friend and devours like a foe. The calmest seas hide dangerous rocks. The wolf jets in weather's fells, which means struts about in the pouring rain. <laughs> Many good sentences are spoken by Danus to shadow his knavery and written by poets as ornaments to beautify their works and set their trumpery to sail without suspect which is respect, really. No marvel, though, Plato shut them out of his school and banished them quite from his commonwealth as effeminate writers, unprofitable members, and utter enemies to virtue. If you enter the school of poetry, as Gossam calls it, you will pass on to piping, from piping to playing, from play to pleasure, from pleasure to sloth, from sloth to sleep, from sleep to sin, from sin to death, from death to the devil. <laughs> In other words, through disguising its knavery and trumpery, poetry leads you downwards via music, laziness and sin, to hell. <laughs> yep. So Sidney decided to defend poetry against this. And firstly, we should be clear that Sidney uses the word poetry to sometimes mean what we would also call poetry, but at other times he means literary writing, verse, fiction and drama. This poetry has to be defended because it is, he says, always derived from nature. A word, a word which we can take today to mean more like the whole of existence and experience. However, the poet isn't tied into representing nature as it is. Those mathematicians, lawyers, grammarians and philosophers have to do that. Only the poet, disdaining to be tied to any such subjection, lifted up with the vigour of his own invention, doth grow in effect 
into another nature, in making things either better than nature bringeth forth, or quite anew, forms such as never were in nature, as the heroes, demigods, cyclops, chimeras, furies, and such like. So, literature has a Promethean quality of creating nature, when it imitates by means of Aristotle's mimesis, imitation really, Sidney argues it's a representing, counterfeiting, a figuring forth to speak metaphorically, a speaking picture, with this end, to teach and delight. Quite the opposite model of Gossam's uh, syrup and poison, where the problem is the pleasure. This, em- this image of the speaking picture has rightly become famous. Speaking picture, I love it. Poetry as a speaking picture is an idea we can take with us into the present with its purpose to teach and delight. But this poesy has other functions. People sing the psalms, he says, when they're merry. And I know, Sidney says, is used with the fruit of comfort by some when in sorrowful pangs of their death-bringing sins they find the consolation of the never-leaving goodness. So comfort and consolation then, even at death. Again, the opposite view of Gossam, who saw poetry as taking you to the devil. What's more, says Sidney, this purifying of wit, this enriching of memory, enabling of judgment and enlarging of conceit, I'll come back to that word, which commonly we call learning, the final end is to lead and draw us to as high a perfection as our degenerate souls made worse by their clay lodgings, your body can be capable of. So we've got enriching of memory, enabling of judgment, enlarging of our conceptual abilities, that's the conceit, pleasure, consolation, perfection and salvation. This is what you can get from poetry, Sidney is saying. And then in a remarkable passage, Sidney explains that whereas other disciplines explain and argue, poetry can show us emotion Manifest in action. Let us but hear old Anchises speaking in the midst of Troy's flames, or see Ulysses in the fullness of all Calypso's delights bewail his absence from barren and beggarly Ithaca. We gain what he calls insight into anger when we see Sophocles Ajax whipping sheep and oxen, and further insights into feelings such as Remorse of conscience in Oedipus, soon repenting pride in Agamemnon, self-devouring cruelty in Atreus, the violence of ambition in the two Theban brothers, and the sour sweetness of revenge in Medea. And how do we as readers and listeners receive these? Sidney says, we seem not to hear of them, but clearly to see through them. We seem not to hear of them, but clearly to see through them. So that's to say, I think, that through absorbing these moments in literature, we come to understand their true purpose and essence. Their meaning becomes clear or even transparent without our consciously hearing how. The result of all this is that when we read, say, of Dives Burning in Hell and Lazarus in Abraham's Bosom, he says these end up inhabiting both the memory and judgment. So he's saying, by showing us these emotions in action, poetry ends up being memorable, but also ends up by being absorbed into our judgment, or as we might call it today, our value system. The poet, Sidney concludes, is a popular philosopher. But this isn't boring taught philosophy, and he mocks dry, dusty academic philosophy teaching. This kind of teaching through poetry happens in another way. For who will be taught if he be not moved with desire to be taught? For who will be taught if he be not moved with desire to be taught? A notion that flew in the face of all the caners, beaters, drillers and bores of Sidney's own time and goes on flying down through the centuries ever since. The poet, and he really does mean our meaning of poet here, can do this because he cometh to you with words set in delightful proportion either accompanied with or prepared for the well-enchanting skill of music. And as an aside, he adds, it's not just the great classic writers who do this. 
Certainly I must confess mine own barbarousness. I never heard the old song of Percy and Douglas, but I found not my heart moved more than with a trumpet, and yet is it sung by some blind crowder. He's referring here to the old folk ballad now known as Chevy Chase. But how does poetry work? Sidney says, verse, far exceedeth prose in the knitting up of the memory. The reason is manifest, the words, besides their delight, which hath a great affinity to memory, being so set as one cannot be lost, but the whole work fails. Besides one word, so as it were, begetting another, as be it in rhyme or measured verse, by the former a man shall have a near guess to the follower. So there is in poetry a way in which a formal poem is measured out in such a way that dropping a word spoils the whole lot. And this in turn gives it a predictive quality. The pattern enables us to sense what's coming next. Now I think all this constitutes a fascinating defence. There's a good deal we can take straight into now to help us understand what poetry offers us and what poetry can do. But surely, in the present context, poetry doesn't need to be defended. And I should say my job today is not to talk about poetry in general, as Sidney did, but to defend it as an art for children. And yet, surely, no one is attacking it. Well, I'm going to suggest that there has been an attack, and the attack has gone on by default, even as publicly and in official policy it's been defended. The process will be familiar to many of you, if only because I've talked about it before, perhaps too often, so excuse me going over old ground, even using the same examples. <laughs> Apologies. I'll put it this way. I was speaking at a joint meeting of head teachers from the NAHT and teachers from the NUT to discuss the forthcoming campaign against SATs. One head teacher was quite explicit. He said that he taught at a school made up almost entirely of children whose first language is not English. By comparing results in the SATs from year to year, he now knows, or is it thinks perhaps, that he can inch his school's position up the local league tables if he drops all reading of poetry and stories and spends most of year six drilling the children in exercises geared to matching the test. He hates doing it, he says. He can see the effect it has on the children emotionally, behaviorally, and intellectually, he said. But the league tables rule. He would love to be reading stories and poetry, but he can't take the risk, he said. So we don't have a Stephen Gosson, as Philip Sidney had, we have a process, or is it a set of practices that quietly and insidiously have taken over in many schools? Not all schools, by any means, where teachers and parents have had the confidence to carry on reading and enjoying all books, poetry included, this attack has been resisted. What's more? where parents have the knowledge and experience of what books and poetry can do for children, they too have carried on borrowing, buying, reading books and poetry with their children. Which leaves a percentage, how big, perhaps we'll never know, of children of whom we can say if they don't come across books and poetry when they're at school, they will probably never come across it. But somewhere deeply embedded in what I've called a quiet and insidious practice is a notion that says in effect, so be it. Doesn't matter. If those children don't get books and poetry, tough. Instead of Sidney's account of insight into anger, the soon repenting pride in Agamemnon, the self devouring cruelty in Atreus, the violence of ambition in the two Theban brothers, and the sour sweetness of revenge in Medea, those children will have this. And again, excuse me to those who've heard me read this before. I quote verbatim from a worksheet, and in its entirety, it's not me cutting it. Quote begins here. Perseus and the Gorgons. This is part of a myth from ancient Greece. At last Perseus found the Gorgons. They were asleep among the rocks, and Perseus was able to look at them safely. Although they were asleep, the live serpents which formed their hair were writhing venomously. The sight filled Perseus with horror. How could he get near enough without being turned to stone? Suddenly Perseus knew what to do. He now understood why Athena had given him the shining bronze shield. Looking into it, he saw clearly the reflection of the Gorgons. Using the shield as a mirror, he crept forward. Then with a single swift blow, he cut off the head of the nearest Gorgon. Her name was Medusa. In one mighty swoop, Perseus grabbed the head of Medusa. He placed it safely in his bag. 
and sprang into the air on his winged sandals. To my mind, this is utterly insufficient. It's an act of deliberate deprivation to deliver this up to children, as it denies them the context and motive for action, and in so doing, drains the story of fear and tension. Or to put it another way, as we don't know why Percy is going to see the Gorgons, we don't feel with him the danger. We don't feel the danger, we don't enjoy the ingenuity of his success, nor the pleasure in his ultimate victory. The engine at the heart of literature has been taken out of its piece purely in order that the writing can be used as a pretext for asking a set of comprehension questions, as printed on the other side of the story. <laughs> Why had Perseus brought a bag with him? <laughs> Who had given Perseus his shield? And so on for ten more questions like it, each with specifically right answers. Empiricism has seized power. Sydney is overthrown. So I say in the face of this kind of mental cruelty, I think we need a stouter defence of poetry for children, and perhaps I'll leak over into Sydney's broader use of the word poetry than our contemporary usage, just a stouter defence as Sydney offered, where he was speaking with all the confidence of a rising class of Tudor Protestant nationalists and humanists. I'll borrow some of that humanism and marry it to some ideas to do with the rights of individuals to explore their identities, including and especially language, along with what is in effect a form of internationalism, which work in classrooms affords us. Well, I've spoken too long on this subject without reading a poem, um, not one of mine. This one's called My Mate Darren, and it's by a guy called Paul Lyles. Where are you, Paul? When I was a kid, my best mate Darren had a great way of getting his toy soldiers to have a war. He had lined them up on the kitchen floor, close the kitchen door, draw the kitchen window blind, set an alarm clock to ring in one minute's time, switch off the kitchen light, making the kitchen dark as night. Then he would take his tennis racket and swing it from left to right with all his might, knocking his soldiers everywhere, sending them flying through the air, making them spin. Even his dog joined in, scampering about with a mouthful of toy soldiers sticking out. Then, when the alarm clock would ring, whichever side had the most soldiers still standing would win. <laughs> Years later, Darren, now a man, strong and big, was helping his mum bring in a brand new fridge. When he moved the old one, he found underneath in the dirt and the grease three toy soldiers who were still fighting the war, <laughs> waiting for an enemy that wasn't there anymore. He dusted them down, stood them gently on the ground, and with as much love as he could, he told them, it's over. <laughs> you no longer need to be a toy soldier. You can go back to your wives, your families and friends you used to know. Lead your formal lives. The fighting finished ten years ago. As gently as he could, he told them, there is no more war. But no one told the dog. <laughs> who ran back in and chewed them up once more. <laughs> first point would be to say that poetry like this does a lot of things at the same time. Here are some. It tells a story. It offers us Sydney's speaking picture, which in turn teaches and delights us, and delights us in many different ways, one of which is that it is derived from nature, as we would say now, from experience and existence. But part of this is that, Sydney's words, it counterfeits and represents, that's to say there's something symbolic going on in the poem that is more than what it appears to be talking about. There's also emotion manifest in action, some of which we can give names to, maybe delight in play, something to do with the absurdity of war or destruction, something to do with the difference between humans and animals, perhaps, and a whole lot more besides. We've also got something here of Sydney's well-enchanting skill of music. 
the unfolding of the poem with its rhythm and rhyme and the expectations that go with these, give us the sense that this story will roll along through to a conclusion. But also perhaps in the rhyme, there is some kind of gentle self-mockery that undermines the seriousness of the protagonist. And what are the Promethean aspects? Well, the construction of the whole piece, its crescendo, Darren's supposed speech, are precisely this, a form that was never in nature, as Sidney says. And the poem enters Sidney's memory and judgment. We are aided in the memory by the rhyme. When I see Paul Lyles, I've started saying to him, there is no more war, but no one told his dog who ran back in and chewed them up once more. And what about the judgment, the value system inside us? by some process that Sidney says taught us by moving us to be taught. The values of the poem find their way in, find their place, in habit, Sidney says, perhaps snugly, perhaps by challenging it, perhaps by cooperating with it, in whatever value system we call our own. So at one level, perhaps, it does say with the poem, no more war, but at another, doesn't the poem perhaps have a laugh at the simplicity, or is it the simplistic nature of saying no more war? Is there a conversation here perhaps being had with the end of Dolce Decorum Est? And Wilfred Owen says, If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, Dolce et Decorum Est, Pro Patria Mori. Then again, the poem seems also to be inhabiting similar territory, but in a comic, ironic way, to the end of the house at Pooh Corner. Christopher Robin was going away. Nobody knew why he was going. Nobody knew where he was going. Indeed, nobody even knew why he knew that Christopher Robin was going away. In Mill's words, there's something ineffable and mysterious about the going away of growing up. But then, in place of that enchanted place on the top of the forest where a little boy and his bear will always be playing, we've got the gritty naturalism of Paul Lyle's soldiers stuck under an old fridge, followed by the dog eating them again. So I think this constitutes something like Sidney's popular philosophy. In the place of A.A. Milne's time-fighting suggestion that either childhood goes on forever or that it survives because of his own book, we have Lyle's bluntness that leaves us with Darren not as a child, but as a man, and the soldier's gone, apart once again from their presence on the page in Lyle's poem. The poem plays with time, change, and continuity. It sends us, sends us as adult readers, back to our childhoods. The children, I suspect, it breaks them out of their synchronic continuum, living in the present. The state of permanent childhood, which I can never sort out clearly in my mind, if it's something we foist on children or something they fight to preserve, and it brings them sharply into the diachronic, the historical continuum, so brilliantly and amazingly presented to us, of course, by Philippa herself with Tom's Midnight Garden. So yes, popular philosophy too. Something I like about Sidney's defence is that it appears to be talking about wisdom encapsulated in poetry. He talks of insights and judgment and learning. I see literature as being, in effect, 3,000 years of wisdom about human behaviour put in a form that we can understand and take pleasure in. And yet, for some incredible reason, we've created an environment in some schools, some classrooms, not all, please note, where the writing of summarisers, extract hacks, and writer substitutes has been promoted above the level of those who spend their whole lives trying to perfect ways of encapsulating wisdom and feeling into literary form. So not only do we get the banal rewriting of part of a myth, but we also get, and I'll hesitate to give the exact example, people who produce school textbooks on, say, personal development, which include sessions on bereavement, anger, jealousy and the like, but the writer of the lesson plans, knowing that poetry, that sort of stuff, often deals with this sort of thing, chooses not to find great poetry to stimulate talk about such things. Instead, she sticks in a bunch of poems of her own, saying hereby, all that stuff written in the previous 3,000 years won't be able to do its job better than me. So I'm going to say that what poetry and all fictions do 
is encapsulate wisdom about human behaviour. And they do this, as Sydney implies, by marrying ideas with feeling and putting them into sequences derived originally from experience and existence, but which may also involve creatures and beings that have never been seen or heard of before. And in the process of reading this, we will find out what it feels like to be someone facing danger or love or disaster or fun or whatever. The poem or the story will do some experimenting for us. Now, I would like to add on some more defences. First, let's hear a poem. It's called The Angler's Song by Jackie Kay. Down where I am, my love, there is no love. There is no light, no break of day, no rising sun. Where I am, I call you in. I open my large mouth. The only light down here comes from my body. Down where I am is deeper than you imagine. There is no food, no easy prey, and it is freezing cold. I sing to make you say my name. My big eyes weep. This is the world of never-ending darkness, like pain. Come down, I've been waiting for you a long time. I wait without appearing to wait. I see without being seen to see. You know me, I am big-headed, I am hideous, I am ugly. Come down, when I find you, I will bite into your belly. What you see is what you get with me. There is no other way I will become you, let us say. All that will be left of me will be my breathing. Come down where I am, in and out, out and in, down at the very bottom of the deep dark sea. When I become you, my mouth will stay open, my open mouth like the river mouth down at the bottom. Come down where I am. I will flash my lights for you. My large eyes will take you in, contain you. I make no promises. I offer nothing, not even light. Down, deep down in the dark, at the bottom, is my bed. My sea bed, love, where there are no promises of love. Dark, where there are no promises of light. Where there is little hope of food. Where day and night are night and day. My sea bed, I tell no lies so your heart will not be broken. I offer nothing. All you will have is my breathing, but I will give myself up to you. I will give myself up for you. Much of children's lives are circumscribed by explicit and implicit rules. We'll come back to the poem. These come ultimately from all the adults around them. No matter how hard we as adults try, we find it very difficult to grant children autonomy over parts of their own lives, even when there's no justification in an argument for health and safety or psychological danger or whatever. I look at our new kitchen and realise that at present we've put lots of things out of reach of the children. Is there any reason why children shouldn't be able to get a bowl or a cup by themselves? Why have we built independence even into our kitchen? Well, I think poetry, when handled well, offers autonomy. It does this, I would argue, through several channels. Suggestion, reflection, juxtaposition, physicality of language, mutability or changeability of language, and interculturalism. In Jackie Kay's poem, she writes, My seabed I tell no lies, so your heart will not be broken. I offer nothing. This is elliptical. We have no means to judge or determine exactly why the anglerfish will tell no lies, why it will offer nothing. All we can do is infer and guess and wonder. We will occupy a space that is unfamiliar for many children, yet it's one which is terribly important. A space where vague and indeterminate sensations are all we have to go on. Very often, for life to carry on, we can't assume that there are right and wrong answers. We have to figure out what other people's behaviour is about and for. And this sort of thing needs reflection. And yet it seems that for some children, some schools are forced into saying, in effect, well, there isn't time for reflection. 
And I mean here the kind of reflection that looks at something, wonders about it, and hears a variety of voices alongside you that also wonder about it. I'm not such a poetry chauvinist that I think this can only come about through poetry. It can come about from a group of children looking at how a dandelion has grown between two cracks in the pavement. Poetry, nevertheless, offers us this potential. My seabed, I tell no lies, so your heart will not be broken. I offer nothing. All you will have is my breathing, but I will give myself up to you. I will give myself up for you. The meaning of poetry does indeed often come to us musically, repetition being one of the musical cadences available to poets. But it also comes to us through the sideways process of juxtaposition. Here Jackie Kay has juxtaposed the idea of a seabed with no lies, with no heart broken, and then with nothingness being on offer. Then on to all that's being offered is breathing. Then on to the idea that the I of the poem will give itself up to the you of the poem. These six or so images aren't necessarily or easily linked. They're only two connectors, as they say in the national curriculum, a so and a but. But they don't really seem to help us in making a logical connection between things. But please note, extract writers, comprehension question setters, SATs testers, logic is not what is going on here. The poem is forcing us to make connections simply by placing images side by side. I can't speak for people here, but by reading, rereading, reading and thinking, I start to get a feeling about the angler fish, perhaps a feeling about me, a feeling about saying things through breathing and not talking, a feeling about trust, I think, in some kind of bed. I'm going to make the claim that to go through this process in an open-ended way, in a cooperative way with people you trust, or entirely on your own, gives children and all of us a chance to investigate how and why, in daily life as lived, feelings and ideas are inseparable. Feelings and ideas are inseparable. <laughs> Moving on, Sydney also talked of poetry's music and proportion. And following that, I think in one respect, one side of poetry has a particular part to play in children's lives. It's in its physicality. He had a little sticker and he... He had a little sticker and he had a little ticket. And he took the little sticker and he stuck it to the ticket. Now, he hasn't got a sticker and he hasn't got a ticket. He's got a bit of both, which he calls a little sticket. <laughs> well, they won't let you on the bus with a sticket. <laughs> Whatever else this poem does, it draws attention to something about the similarity of the words sticker, ticket, stuck and stick it. This runs across what language is thought to do, which is that it's there to convey meaning, as if words only exist to give you facts. Turns out the poem conveys very little factual meaning apart from making a connection between words, as they say, at the level of the signifier. For children, this has a special role. One of the important parts of being a child is hearing words, whether spoken directly to you or spoken in the air, without knowing what they mean. Instead, all you hear is the word's physicality, its material existence, if you like, its sound, its tone, its pitch, its volume, its rhythm, its place in a cadence of words and the like. In this environment, such words exist as signifiers without signifying through what's being called the process of denoting. Instead, it conveys feeling through connoting, gathering up and delivering the words associations. As people like Julie Kristeva and Jacques Derrida have suggested, a lot of what's being connoted will be because of how one word sounds in relation to the similar sounding words around it. Apart from poetry and song, there are very few, if any, outlets for children in schools to exist, sorry, to explore this area of being. Much of which, if you think about it, must be tinged with anxiety. Think of how we feel when we travel to countries where we can't speak the language. Physical poetry, like my Stick a Ticket poem, allows, I would suggest, a release through play from some of that anxiety. It plays with words instead of treating them as sacrosanct little parcels of meaning signifying, sorry, it offers relief from the relentless signifying of history, geography, math, school rules, home rules, and comprehension exercises about the Gorgons. <laughs> it gives us all, but children in particular, a space in which to acknowledge with them 
the fact that language exists in its own right as a puzzling, peculiar set of phenomena, just as rocks, birds and houses exist in their own right. Poetry is then also about language itself. But there's more to this. When we show children words being physical, we also show them that language is changeable, it's mutable. It can be played with according to patterns of sound in order sometimes to see what signifiers might spring up. And this is one of the bases of nonsense poetry, which creates new worlds, just as Sidney described, often held together by recurring sounds, peopled by pe beings whose names like jumblies, jabberwocks, and snarks half echo previously heard places, people, and creatures. Most of education travels in the opposite direction. It teaches correct usage as handed down from those of us who know what correctness is. It teaches apposite and appropriate usage, le mot juste, whether that's in French, maths, history, school rules, or wherever. A lot of poetry, in particular poetry for children, suggests that that correctness or appropriateness can be subverted, and you, children, can, if you want, subvert it too. Ladles and jelly spoons. I come before you to stand behind you, to tell you something I know nothing about. Next Thursday, which is Good Friday, there'll be a mother's meeting for fathers only. Admission is free, pay at the door, pull up a seat and sit on the floor. And we'll be discussing the four corners of the round table. Apart from anything else, this suggests that it's not only language that is something you can play with, but so is the world. And so to interculturalism. Now it's been argued that Sidney's apology was in part a defence of something specifically English. There hasn't been time to explore this. In place of this, I would want to pose a process that is rarely celebrated in relation to poetry. I would argue that no matter how we write, or even how we read, we do so with the culture we own, live with, and live through. We can't escape the processes, the processes of acculturation that we have lived. Food, language, gesture, frame of mind, habits, all of it and much more. Poetry can't escape it either. However, there's a theory around in education that knowledge and skills are value-free, that they aren't cultural, or if they are, there are some that are so absolute and universal we shouldn't waste our time describing them as being cultural. Poetry doesn't waste much time doing this either. It just gets on and does culture. It expresses the way we are, the way we live, the way we think. It offers this up in what are now, less so in Sydney's time, a huge range of forms, some very short, others long and expository. It can be imagistic or full of dialogue, it can be interior monologue, it can be narrative. Or it can fight narrative and explore the state of being and existence. It can draw attention to its writerliness by playing with words, or it can appear, so this will be an illusion, to be seamless with reality by being bald, concise and simple. All this makes it hugely various, open to choice by readers to find the shapes and forms that they want and like, and indeed might want to adopt or adapt themselves. More mutability. This one's called The Difference. In Glasgow, the hotel gave us something called So. In Edinburgh, the hotel gave us the same stuff, and it was called Skin Care Bar. <laughs> <laughs> so by scavenging around in the displayed words and detritus of human existence, itself an important process to show children, poetry can express how people define themselves. If we put that into an open-ended context of several or many people sharing ideas like this, poetry becomes intercultural. It shares. I would suggest, just as Sidney did, in claiming a seriousness for poetry at the level of salvation, that in a way, interculturalism possesses the ingredients for a kind of salvation, not heavenly but earthly. I've seen children looking at pictures of refugees escaping the bombing of Barcelona in 1936, and then writing poems based on the idea that right now they've got to leave and take with them important things important memories, important wishes and desires. And then I've seen these children, 
some of them refugees themselves, from a wide range of faith and national backgrounds, Bangladesh, Nigeria, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe and the UK, share these around in a circle, talking of such intimate details as a hug from a grandmother or a look in someone's eyes. Whatever else we do to make the world safer and better, we will have to do quite a lot of this kind of sharing of feeling and understanding. <coughs> Thank you very much. Stand up and say your question really loudly, or say it to them, and they'll say it to us really loudly. They're loud people, are they? They're loud people. Oh, right, very okay. good. Are they mischievous? <laughs> oh, I think so. They're poets, players, and jesters. <laughs> it's called Michael Rosen's A to Z, the best children's poetry from Agard to Zephaniah. There are two poems by about I haven't counted, actually, about 42 poets. So it begins in A, and then goes all the way through to Z. But there's a bit of a problem round about X. <laughs> I think, was there Q as a problem? I don't know, there were one or two that offered a little bit of a problem, so I kind of made up some ones for them. <laughs> so I think it says under X. You can learn your own poems off by heart, Michael, it would help. X marks the spot where there could be a poet. Is the poet you? And then you can go back to you to see if it is you. <laughs> and then under you it says, You are a poet, and here is your poem. And then there's a blank. <laughs> it's just to come out, shall we? Yeah. Uh, sorry, is it the guy there? Yeah? Many of us, including myself, and their appreciation of poetry grew in for many years by having to learn great tracks of it I wrote at school. Yeah. I'm from that generation. What, what is your view about the value or the, the attitude value about the children learning poetry? Uh, make it nice. Really? That's my theoretical position on that. <laughs> uh, is that, yeah, I mean, you have to. As Sydney says, you have to create the desire for the children to want to learn it. Now, some poems will just do it for you anyway, as a five year old, six year old, seven year old. You know, my daughter, or I know, slight sort of leaning towards poetry in her home, but even so, <laughs> uh, you know, she's learned a couple of poems at school just because she liked the sound of them and started playing with them and so on. And I think the problem is, is we've forgotten how to fill our classrooms with poetry so that it's the place that children can go to rather than it's something that you have to answer questions on. So there should be poetry up on the walls that changes and you don't, as a teacher, have to explain why you're changing it. You just bung it up on the wall. You find a poem, stick it up on the wall, write it out in your own handwriting in very big letters and then a fortnight later take it down. And if the children, they'll start asking you, why are you doing that? And you say, I don't know, really. I, I just quite like it. <laughs> what do you think of it? And you can leave a little pile of post-its and say, well, if there's anything that occurs to you about it. You know, and then you can also have sessions where we read poems out loud to each other. You call it the poetry show. And you will find that if you do that sort of thing, you have a recording, your little mini recording studio in the corner, your little microphone and a, whatever these things are called now, these little ones, you know, and then they, they record it and play it back to each other. And then... And so on. And once you can make those connections with the idea that poetry can be in the spaces between us, because the trouble is we've sort of made it a subject. I mean, I understand I'm partly to blame for that sort of thing, but I've sort of gone along with it. But in a way, poetry exists best as mortar, not as bricks. It's the bits in between all the time. So that you, you find your way to it as part of normal living. 
and you create like a poetry wall and you get kids to bring in poems and to make anthologies. So the problem with the way they did it, and I'm the same generation obviously, was that they did make it very formal. And then when they spotted that some kids didn't like it at my school, they kind of, they just weaned their, weeded them out. So they said, hard like, you're not a poetry person. So we had effectively, you had a kind of poetry choir, <laughs> you know. And, and so the poetry choir then did choral speaking. No, for those of you who know, I'm not going to do it now. No, anyway. Yeah, my little choral speaking act. But yeah, so we did choral speaking. And I loved it. But then, I, you know, I came from a home where my mother used to walk around the house kind of thinking she was WB Yeats, you know. So, no, mum, you're not WB Yeats, you know, that sort of thing. And, and, and my dad and both of them taught poetry like crazy. So I thought this was great, you know, when we did, um, like, I'll interview as it happens, but also... Um, the Louis McNeese poem uh, I'm not yet born uh, prayer for prayer before, prayer before birth yeah I just thought this was bloody incredible this is just wonderful so but it's it's the kids who don't so you have to make it part of the mortar that's what I'd say but I, I'm in favour of kids learning it but the desire go back to Sydney amazing eh? 1579 they've got a desire to be taught it's got to be there you've got to have the desire Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah, bring the outside in, bring all that in, and yes, of course. And of course, you know, we do have people like Julia Donaldson. You know, we have something like Room on the Broom, the Gruffalo, uh, the smartest giant in town. You know, it's really good making a tune up for that one. Those of you who've got four year olds, could I just recommend you make up a sort of putting on the Ritz type tune for it? It really is brilliant. Anyway, sorry, I was sort of distracted there. But, you know, this stuff, the children are getting, in some ways, now, more poetry than they've ever had before. They've got the nursery rhymes, but a lot of the picture books for two, three, and four-year-olds, even ones about aliens in underpants, um, of which are a remarkable number. So a lot of underpants picture books out there. A lot of them in verse. But anyway, there's a lot of it there. And, and children, you know, we know that children make up a form of that kind of nonsense poetry as they learn how to speak and to play with language. We spent a long time in France in the summer and I suddenly heard my four-year-old talking French. The only thing is he wasn't talking French, he was doing the sound of French. So he was walking around in the garden going, I know, I know. I'm talking, I'm talking French. <laughs> Um, I remember one of my other kids that was in France for a long time, he said, Dad, I know what the French word for web is. For web? <laughs> Toile d'araignée. He's kind of incredible. He's about three. Where's he picked up? He said, yeah, Dad, it's web. <laughs> <laughs> it's the physicality thing. Yeah. So yes, just it's a it's a question of carrying it on into the classroom and not stamping on it. As dear old Avery Mitchell, not with us anymore, kept saying, he said, Why do you hear people saying to their kids when they're singing or whatever, shut up? <laughs> he said, It's like kind of why? Why why would you do that? He says, It's extraordinary. It's just and then they learn not to do it. That's what we teach them. We teach them to shut up and not to sing and to make up funny words and the rest of it. He said it's a taught thing. I'd never seen it quite that way until he said it, you know, it's via Blake, of course. Um, but he, he just said, you know, you see people, the kids go, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Um, Sorry, I'm just going to Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, I keep on thinking about your head teacher who had a school where the children didn't have essentially a first common language. And um, I wonder what you would wish that you would do. I mean, is it that the children have to have a, have to have a common language first before they can share it nicely? Or can they use poetry to acquire a common language and ascend the leave table? Well, one of the problems is that we've devised a system that assumes that all children, whether English as a first language or as a second language, that the stuff you've got, please leave at the door. 
because you talk bad language. I arrived at the school once and the head teacher said, oh, I'm so glad you've come, Michael, because you must remember that the children here have got no language. <laughs> it's an ordinary primary school. You know? I said, oh, that's funny, because I heard quite a lot of noise in the playground. <laughs> and she said, oh, yeah, I said, no, no, I know what you mean, yeah. No, I, I'm talking about bad language. So I said, what do you mean? They're running about saying fuck off, are they? <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I don't mean vulgar. No, no. No, I just, I just mean... Uh, well, anyway, when you get in there, you'll find out. So I went in there and did what I always do, which is, you know, dance about and do poems and things. I love that connection between poetry, playing and jesting. It's, you know, it's great. Thank you, Mr. Puritan. Um, that's exactly what I do. And piping. I must take up piping. Um, <laughs> And in fact, that was the school where, you know, now it's sort of embedded in my head, where I said, down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Jim. He didn't know me, and I didn't know him. And this boy shouted out, well, how do you know his name was Jim then? (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, that sort of language should be kept at the door. (laughs) But the whole history of education is about leaving the child's language at the door unless you are sufficiently sophisticated and happen to have parents who, you know, talk like teachers and all the rest of it, um, you should leave it at the door. So all these kids have got bad language. We've now got this completely spurious notion about word poverty that uh, dear old Jim Rose talks about. So there's the idea. And then all these other kids are speaking all this great babble of other languages. Leave it at the door and we'll get on with nice, pure, clean language, the kind of thing you get on worksheets, and we'll get them through there. Now, I think the whole thing is a fallacy because, apart from anything else, what you're doing, if you leave the language you've got at the door, you're basically leaving your cognition at the door. You know, it is a basic, basic error that if you're constantly demanding that children leave the language they have somewhere else, where is the language they've got in order to understand the world and emotions and each other and people? Quite apart from the whole kind of cultural cringe it gives you, I'm crap, I'm no good, I'm rubbish because I talk like this and all that. So instead of that, I'd sort of imposing the interculturalism. So, you know, most of the children who have have other languages will also have rhymes and songs in other languages. Share them. So it's ever so simple. You just say, let's talk about how mums and dads sing babies to sleep. You know, and you find there are Turkish lullabies, there are Gujarati lullabies, there are, it doesn't take any time. Everybody's got away. You say, well, my mum sings a Beatles song. You know, it doesn't matter. How, how do you do it? And that, it's ever so simple. You share that. And also, the point about, if we just take poetry on its own, is it offers voices. I mean, Benjamin Zephaniah said to me, oh, well, no, I said to Benjamin, I said, hey, Benjamin, you know all these poems you write, where, where, where do you write them? Where, where, you know, where, what sort of, how do you write them all down? So he said, well, I don't write them. What do you mean? He said, I make them up when I go running. And then, when I do them, I mostly know them off by heart. And then when I do them in front of kids, because of the way I've made them up, children find it very easy to know them. Be nice to your turkeys. It's just there. Boom. You've got it. So, um, it's a fallacy that we think by giving kids the minimal language that somehow or other this is some basic rudimentary tool that will then enable them to build on it. It's a complete fallacy. None of us ever learn language by just learning the minimum. You know, it's why it's like crazy that we go up to very small children and go itsy bitsy Dewey Dewey, this little doggy, you know. I mean, you can just talk in sentences to babies. I mean, it's, it's the language, you know. So in order to get the language, you have to hear it. And the great thing about poetry is that, you know, if you want to say best words in best order, that's fine. But the point is, encapsulated in poetry is stuff that is wrapped up with, the desire, with this desire that Sidney is saying that you want to hear more. Or it's rubbish poetry. So it's got that in it. So that's how the kids can get hold of it. You know, you will get hold of whole slabs of language if you want to be rather reductive about it. And it's just tragic that a head, I mean, I mean, maybe right, maybe wrong, I don't know, but it's the nature of the sats that it's such a narrow linguistic basis to it. I mean, if you look at the questions that are asked of stories on the sats paper, they are identical to those questions about the Gorgon, like what, you know, the wise you brought a bag with it. You know, I mean, what? Why has he brought a bag with him? 
I mean, you weep, don't you? <laughs> you think, Perseus and the Gorgon. Now here's this incredible drama. And then you stop it all, you go, right now, boys and girls. Why is Perseus brought back? <laughs> so that's the track. It's reductive. It's assuming that the less you give them, that you're somehow equipping them. And it's, it's never the case. And it's also the bottom-up theory that has bedeviled education, that if you do everything in small chunks, they'll get to the wider thing. So you have word level, sentence level, text level, you know, all that stuff that they go on about. And again, it's a complete fallacy. You know, it's not how we perceive. It's not where our cognition works. You know, you get the whole story. You know, it's a good, it's a good idiom, the whole story. Give me the whole story, because then you've got the whole story, you can handle it. Give me the word, give me the text. You haven't got it. So... I don't know. I just think it's, it's based on various fallacies, the bottom-up theory, the empirical thing, the idea that words just signify what they're supposed to signify, and the job of teachers is just simply to ask, what does that mean, what's that there for? And that is education. It's, I mean, you know, Dickens so took the mickey out of it, you think everyone would be ashamed to do it ever since. You know, if you look in hard times, read the two chapters where Grad Grind is in full flight, and it's got the most brilliant little interchange between the girl who says... I wonder, and Greg Ryan says, never wonder. <laughs> I mean, it's stunning. I mean, that's what education's been about for the last ten years. Sorry, no time to wonder. I mean, you know, Perseus and the Gorgons. I wonder what it would be like if you were a Gorgon and you could turn somebody into stone. Sorry, we're getting on with the bag. You're doing the bag. <laughs> Why has he brought a bag? No, no, I wonder. Seriously. <laughs> Just imagine this. Just imagine if, you know, I went out to the playground and I could just go, and I'd turn to, yeah. Why did he bring me back? I hope you're going to go home and answer that. Concentrate on that. Are there any more before they chuck you out? Yes, ma'am. Uh, sorry, the only thing I know about the Sing Up program is that somebody rang me up and I did a book of songs called Songs and Songs, Silly Songs, which I, uh, I sang, would you believe, some of them. And they said, from ANC Black, and they said, would I come and sing uh, Susanna's a fine full man, and, and idly down. Susanna's a fine full man, come on, let's just go ring. Anyway, would I come along and sing it? And I said, why? That's because of the Sing Up thingy. So I said, oh, that sounds nice. Well, will the kids go? Susanna's a fine for man. <laughs> I'll leave that. Well, apparently, you will, yeah. So anyway, that sounded good fun. Anyway, no, not just that. I'm sure you're doing lots of other things as well. But, so that, I'm afraid uh, you're, you're playing to my ignorance here. So I don't know what the whole programme is. If lots and lots of people are singing, I'd say, hooray. I just did a thing in Edinburgh with a guy who's a sax player, and his girlfriend uh, is a singer, and she's longing to go into teaching. She said, in fact, she mentioned it as well. She said, because we're all going to sing. And as it happens, I can now remember in 1971, I was at the BBC. Yeah, I was at the BBC doing a look and read series called Sam on Boff's Island. And I said to the woman who was the producer, and I said, hey, why don't we do songs? And she said, we've never done songs. And I said, because if you're doing sound, meaning, and text, well, if you learn a song, which is dead easy to learn, after all, particularly songs on a kind of oral, folky kind of basis, well, then wouldn't they be reading? So then I got two folky friends of mine, Sandra Kerr, who stars off screen as the voiceover of <coughs> Madeline the Doll in Bagpuss. <laughs> Sandra Kerr and her then geezer John Faulkner who is Gabriel the Frog <laughs> okay why did how did Oliver Postgate get them because he did Sam on, did the puppets in Sam on Boss Island and we made up songs and this was thought at the time to be a kind of major revolutionary and extraordinary idea 
But of course, when you go back to the beacon readers of the 1950s, you know, those beastly 1950s, they used to put nursery rhymes in there. We used to learn to read with nursery rhymes. In fact, if you look at some more enlightened 19th century teaching to read things, you'll see songs and so on. Somewhere along the line, somewhere between the beacon readers and phonics, <laughs> we thought that teaching kids to sing and read and enjoy was a sort of crazy idea, but I'm glad to hear that. Anyway, it's back, yes. And the government's bung some money into it. Oh, right. That's helped massively because you don't have copyright problems, which is what you always normally come out with in music. But it means you've got huge amounts of stuff. I think we've got now uh, 300 uh, only so far into the song bank. Because teachers who subscribe can, can download the music this weekend. Well, hey. Wonderful. And meanwhile, on the National Poetry Archive, you can go to the National Poetry Archive, and all the poems there are downloadable and usable in schools, and you've got loads and loads of things out of copyright, but then some that some of us have given permission to be used however you want, and all you've got to do is just click on it and play it. So, yeah, there, there, there are lovely things going on, and, um, well, to be honest, I think they're running scared. I didn't put that bit in the talk, <laughs> but actually they are so worried that it's, in their terms, plateaued out. You know, they talk about bips and troughs and things. Well, it's now plateaued. <laughs> it's, it's not getting better. And they don't know why. And they've discovered they've been boring the pants off them. <laughs> <laughs> Which we told them ten years ago, and they wouldn't. So they're going, well, what should we do? How about books? <laughs> <laughs> I went to see Jim Knight and Ed Balls, and now the new bloke, Vernon Coco. Great name, eh? I went to see him and said, what about books? It's a good idea. It's a good idea, but we're doing it. And then, have you seen In the Thick of It? Which, you know, every time you go and see one of those places up there, it is exactly the same as In the Thick of It. There's the woman, you know, the plumpish woman, who's going, what? And the sort of cynical Oxford kid going, mm. it's exactly the same. You go in there. And there's sort of somebody sitting there going, and there's a kind of Balliol graduate going. <laughs> and you think, how does Armando Iannucci who wrote you? How did he know? <laughs> and they say, we're doing it already. And then they <laughs> steps forward and peels back a little piece of paper and says, well, we're putting some money into the book trust and we're putting some money into reading connections and we're putting some money into the national book trust. And I said, how many schools does that cover? <laughs> it's 4,500. I said, well, what about the other 30,000? <laughs> anyway, and then Vernon said, ah, yes, Mike. The trouble is variability. <laughs> <laughs> What's variability, Vernon? He said, well, I'm a PE man myself. <laughs> and the thing is, in some schools you've got playing fields, the kids aren't doing PE. Other places have got a little tiny playground, and they are. Variability. That's your problem. And I said, well, that, no, no, I, I thought, stay with this. <laughs> I said, that's right, Bernard, that's right. That is very, right, okay, well, it's been lovely seeing you, Mike, thanks very much, and uh, we'll get back to you. They always say that, we'll get back to you. Anyway, there you go. Well, that is the end of it, there isn't any more, it's all right. It the, uh, that was me suggesting books. <laughs> weird revolutionary idea that you could read books in their entirety, you know, from the beginning to the end. It's like, you know, I mean, I, you know, my parents were commies and, you know, and I hang about with trots and things, you know, it is a pretty revolutionary idea, you know, read a whole book. I can see why it's made. <laughs> yeah, and you see, yo, you're worried about it. <laughs> he's, he's worried now. Read up here. Do you read whole books? Have you read a whole book? What have you read? Sorry? The Snow. The Snowmates? I don't know that. Who's that by? Jan Mark. Jan Mark? Oh, right. I don't know that one by her. Is that good? 
Great, the snow maids. I'll look that out. I know the one with the story, nothing to be afraid of. Have you, is it in there? It's not in there, is it? That's the first story in there is about some, a very, very scary one. The very first one's called Nothing, you must read that one, Nothing to be Afraid of. And there's quite a lot to be afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> very good. All right, Jan Mark, The Snow Maids. Anyone know that one? Yep. Yeah, is it good? Yeah. Yeah, you both know All right, good. I'll read that. Thank you for the tip, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Lovely. I think we better end soon, don't we? She's asleep, sorry. <laughs> this is Laura. We've known each other for a long time. And, um, it's been lovely. Thank you, Laura. She wasn't asleep. That was lies. I was that was me making nature, wasn't it? Lying, in other words. Counterfeiting. Thank you, Laura.